we are starting a bit earlier, and I think that's fine as, uh, since we can also start lunch earlier, or we can have more time for the discussion, for more questions and discussions. So welcome to the parallel sessions of the 2017 Pacific Update Conference. So this is session 1A, the Achieving a Blue-Green Economy. Uh, chairing this session is Mr. Gordon Burns. He's the Councillor for Regional Development Cooperation at the Australian High Commission in Suva. Gordon and his team at DFAT Regional Work in Climate Change and Resilience, as well as Education, Health, and Gender. He has worked with the Australian Aid Program for the past 13 years, primarily on Pacific issues, and prior to that, he was a management consultant with the firm Booz Allen Hamilton. So to uh, open this session and to chair the session, Mr. Burns. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, good morning, everybody. And um, I might, um, I relatively recently returned from the USP Council meeting in uh, Majuro and um, I see the Pro-Chancellor with us for this session. Good morning. <laughs> Um, I thought I might adapt something I learnt there from um, Cook Islands Prime Minister Henry Puna, which was um, a diplomatic nicety um, to say, all protocols observed to begin with. So, uh, good morning everybody. This is also the first time I've been streamed live, so everybody, if you could please be um, uh, gentle. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a new experience. So. Um, hello to everybody out there in the, the land of the internet. Um, I think that's also maybe a small personal example of how um, fast our economies and societies are changing with uh, technology, um, that we're in a um, wonderful conference like this and we're also connected immediately to the rest of the world. Um, it's a real honour for me to um, be the chair of this um, um, parallel session, 1A, uh, on the blue, achieving a blue-green economy. Not to suggest that any parallel sessions are more equal than any other parallel sessions, um, but I do feel like um, this is a very important um, session and uh, recognising that it's, um, it's at the centre of uh, one of the three um, uh, and I think very well selected um, focuses of this, um, of this conference. So um, there's a whole bunch of ideas swirling around um, and it's whirling particularly fast this year in 2017 with um, both um, Pacific uh, leadership of the major SDG 14 conference we've just seen and I'm really looking forward to hearing from Dr Hills the update um, and read out from that conference and also with the um, first time a small island developing state um, has uh, um, held the presidency of the um, Conference of the Parties to the, um, uh, to, for UNFCCC. And so the, the prospect of a Pacific Conference of the Parties this year, in, in a year that's turned out to be such a crucial year in uh, climate negotiations and, and progress on that front. Um, so I'm very excited to hear from the speakers um, about um, all of these ideas that are swirling around um, and one thing that is, I think, um, an additional source of excitement for me um, around the, the notion of achieving a blue-green economy is that in a space where we're often confronted by um, um, research which could lead you to feel a little disheartened um, or concerned, this is um, a, a space and a, and a framework for thinking where um, we're looking at something optimistically about w what's the opportunity to consider development in a Pacific context that's relevant um, to identity and society. What does it mean to be uh, a steward of a large ocean uh, state and, and oceanic people um, and how to balance responsibility with uh, utilisation of um, natural resources um, in the context of um, things that we hear uh, an example of, I think, a, a point from re the research that's really um, captured uh, people's attention this year, certainly mine, is this uh, figure, I'm sure you've all heard it now, that potentially within our lifetime or the lifetime of our children, there might be more plastic by weight in the ocean than there is fish. 
uh, and that's a really striking figure. So um, in the context of that uh, sort of concerning, um, um, you know, concerning climate and environmental um, uh, um, research, it's exciting to have an agenda here that's, that's um, really positive and forward looking and, um, and looking at um, what's possible here in the Pacific. So with that as an introduction, uh, I'd now like to uh, call on our first presenter, um, Tess Newton Kane, um, to present her uh, paper on um, what has been the impact of blue green growth in the Pacific. Thank you, Gordon, and uh, thank you to the organisers for um, giving us an opportunity to present the findings of, or the interim findings of an ongoing research project. You can see the names of the members of the research team there, and I drew the short straw in more than one way of being up here talking. They're all sitting there keenly, keenly ready to answer your very difficult questions later. Um, I would just draw your attention to this document, which you can pick up from the back table, I believe. It's hot off the press. It's a Pacific Leadership Program briefing note, which also provides some information about this research project. So there, are, there is the research team. In the USP corner, we have Sandra Tart and Wesley Morgan. And in the ANU corner, you have me and Matthew Dornan. And as you can see, Sandra and I look much more excited about this than our very serious young male colleagues. These are the research questions that we developed at the start of this process. It's been a, a fairly lengthy process through various stages. And as, as it won't come as a surprise to you to learn that some of these questions have, have changed, have taken on different iterations, some have moved around a bit in terms of the priority that they've given, that they've given. But these are the questions that we started off with in terms of how we would look at the role of concepts such as green growth or the blue-green economy in policy making in the Pacific Island region. <coughs> So our interim findings, and they are interim findings, we've completed the field work, which included spending time in both Vanuatu and here in Fiji, and we're now in the process of doing some analysis and preparing um, some papers around this. But these are our interim findings. The ones that are italicized and underlined are the ones that I'm going to talk about in a little more detail during this presentation. Um, the others, the other two, are quite important and I will come back to them later on because they they are increasingly becoming the um, the overarching narratives that we're dealing with one is the lack of definition which is possibly better framed in terms of multiple definitions of what green growth means what it means politically what it means in terms of policy making what it means in terms of policy implementation and also this issue of trade-offs so where, where do these trade-offs arise in terms of explicit acknowledgement in policy documentation? And possibly more significantly, where are they going to arise or where is the potential for them to arise in terms of how policy is implemented? And in particular, that's things around the trade-off between increasing economic growth, particularly in terms of GDP growth, as opposed to or as contrasted with or traded off against environmental management or social inclusion. So what we've already discovered and what we're still working through our thinking about is the multiple pathways and discourses that arise within a, a more global term such as green growth or a blue-green economy. The genealogy of this term or this group of terms at a global level is certainly predates its adoption in the Pacific Island region. So it stemmed from work done through the OECD, the World Bank and other more global or international bodies. In the Pacific context, it seems to have taken on its um, most significant impetus post 2012 and particularly post the Rio 20 plus. Um, convention, which then seemed to um, give a kickstart to a number of 
discussions within the region at regional level and also at national level. So since then, we've seen Pacific leaders and discourses that have appropriated this term and in ways that differ from the more universalist approaches that we might have seen at the global level. And part of that appropriation seems to be a linkage of the term with pre-existing alternative discourses of Pacific development. So prior to 2012, prior to the, the growth of green growth, if you like, we already had um, an established body of Pacific literature which was critiquing the standard models of sustainable development or neoliberal economics as it applies in the Pacific, written by people like Transform Angarao, Ralph Reganvanu and the Pacific Council of Churches. And so that we, we're, we're still working out, but there appears to be um, some convergence there between these newer discourses around green growth and those pre-existing discourses. So if we, if we look at the, the broad contours of these two articulations and start with what the uh, characteristics of the global discourse are, what we, what we can see at that global level, or what we'd already seen, was a relative level of consensus around policy prescriptions, which, you know, at its extreme could be characterized as a one-size-fits-all, but is probably something less than that. A universal, prescri universal prescriptions that were largely technocratic in nature, with particular focus on uh, renewable energy and other sorts of um, very uh, technological um, interventions, a compatibility or a recognition and a promotion of the concept of compatibility of economic growth and environmental management, emphasis on new technologies as I've already said, definitely influenced by climate change, the challenge of climate change and obviously um, increasingly those two conversations are seen in parallel or as linked with each other. And uh, green, the green growth or blue economy concept linked with the goals of big green. So these are the big global NGOs, conservation NGOs, who have relatively recently um, moved to a more pro-business approach. Some people would, at the very critical end, would call that greenwashing. But what we've seen is um, alliances between uh, NGOs and business operations to make business greener and smarter and more sustainable. We've seen it in relation to fisheries and we've seen it in other areas as well. And here is, there aren't very many pictures in this presentation, so thanks to Matt for this picture. This is a picture of the global literature, so it gives an example of, of where that, that global discourse has come from. And it, obviously, it is continuing to evolve just as the discourse is in this part of the world. So moving on to what we've seen as the contours of the green growth discourse, discourse in the Pacific region, here we see that green growth is often characterized or can be characterized much more as an act of self-determination and is often linked with concepts of sovereignty, in particular resource sovereignty, so sovereignty of management of natural resources, whether that's fisheries, logging, uh, or minerals and gas. It also ties in with the Pacific epistemologies, some of which we heard referenced by the Secretary General this morning, issues around stewardship, cultural obligations, preservation of resources and assets for future generations. The Pacific Green Growth Discourse in some areas certainly seems to include um, an acknowledgement, a rhetorical acknowledgement between as of the trade-off between economic growth and social and environmental imperatives. And we've certainly spoken to people who are at the, at the center of these conversations who will say things like, we think it's okay to have less economic growth if it means that our social structure is preserved or our environmental structures are preserved. That's not a unanimous position, but there are certainly voices that, that are um, bringing those sorts of ideas to the fore. Green growth is often, uh, can also be characterized as allowing for economic growth that is compatible with traditional economies, particularly um, the subsistence plus type economies that we see in the Melanesian countries, which is obviously where um, 
the, the bulk of the Pacific populations are. Just as with the global discourse, the Pacific discourse is also influenced by climate change and the global conversations about climate change. In particular, there is um, a very definite stream of this discourse which sees green growth and green, the blue-green economy as a conduit for climate finance as those issues about how much, how, and who gets it are, are, are continued and developed the green growth conversation is playing a very important part in that. It's also linked with conservation efforts as promoted by key individuals and civil society groups in the region. Some of those civil society groups are essentially the Pacific branches of these big global um, NGOs, such as IUCN and WWF. Others are more um, homegrown, if you like, and are more local locally grown groupings, whether it's the Green Growth Leaders Coalition that Aidan's going to talk about later, or other um, more local NGOs or civil society groupings. So our two case study countries are Fiji and Vanuatu, and what we've done here is look at the, um, the role of central planning documents, national planning documents, as vehicles for developing green growth as a policy driver. Now, the, 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 the comparison is between the green growth framework as it exists in Fiji and the National Sustainable Development Plan in Vanuatu. In Vanuatu, the National Sustainable Development Plan is much bigger than green growth. Green growth is one aspect of a bigger plan. So, these comparisons show that there are areas where there are some quite marked differences. There are also some areas where there are some similarities. One of the key similarities that we've noted is that neither of these documents makes an explicit acknowledgement of the potential for trade-offs between economic growth and environmental management. When we talk to the people that were involved in preparing these documents, they say that those trade-offs are acknowledged and were acknowledged as part of how these documents were developed, but it's not explicitly stated. An area of difference between Vanuatu and Fiji is that in Fiji, the green growth framework was developed largely at an intra-governmental level um, with some input from um, uh, Nash, uh, regional NGOs and also a small amount of representation of the wider community via um, the Itauke board. In Vanuatu, the consultation was much more widespread. It involved staff from the Prime Minister's office that led this process, going out and holding community consulta consultations in each of the six provinces. Here's another picture. As you can see, this is the, va this is the Prime Minister's office team, and it was very much an exercise in planes, boats, and automobiles to travel the length and breadth of the country to get this um, sense of community consultation and hopefully co community ownership of what is going to be a key document going forward. We've seen, um, we've seen various strands of external um, cooperation in the development of these documents, whether it's through the ADB by providing technical assistance. Triple GI are also involved in both Fiji and Vanuatu, again in slightly different ways. Triple GI seems to have, in Fiji, is working across uh, quite a large, almost not necessarily whole of government, but is quite centrally, whereas in Vanuatu, Triple GI has its primary point of contact within the Department of Energy, which is a very small part of a ministry in Vanuatu. In Fiji, the green growth framework is characterized as a mechanism for achieving the SDGs. And in Vanuatu, the NSDP has been written so that its goals and objectives are designed to align with the SDGs. And the Prime Minister's Office, particularly their aid coordination team, is very keen to use the reporting that this document will create as a way of coordinating their reporting at national, regional, and international level. Um, and they're already having conversations with development partners and donors around that. So moving on to what we've seen in terms of regional policy approaches, 
We can certainly see that the promotion of um, green growth is linked with regional geopolitics, and we'll hear more from Jeremy about that in terms of Fiji's leadership in this. Looking at the PIDF, the Pacific Islands Development Forum, green growth is essentially its raison d'etre, and it's also its unique selling point. It's what it, it's what it uses to set itself apart from other regional organizations. And as, an, as a point of contrast, the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat uses a different term. It refers to low carbon development uh, rather than green growth. We've certainly seen these concepts linked with Pacific Island collective diplomacy in global arenas, and conservation NGOs are using it as a framing concept. So these are our further questions, and these, these are the questions that are going to inform the work that we'll be doing subsequently, including writing up publications. So just to come back to the point I made about definition, lack of definition, or varying definitions, it is more than semantics. We feel it's key to how these policies become robust in terms of implementation and also how we'll be able to measure them is by coming together around what green growth means in a context, whether it's national or regional. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tess. I'm also very impressed by your time management, Tess. Tess assured me that she would finish in 14 minutes and 32 seconds, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that was very close, setting a very high bar for our next presenter, uh, Jeremy. So um, Jeremy's bringing us a uh, report on the UN Oceans Conference, um, the SDG 14 conference, so thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I was sort of tasked with reporting on the Oceans Conference. Um, it's a bit of a large task to do, I think, in a, a little short slot. So what I'm trying to do is just to give an outline of the, the Oceans Conference and then look up, try and understand what that means for the Pacific and then how that links into the blue economy or the blue-green economy as we're discussing here. So that's the focus of my talk. I should say I'm from the University of the South Pacific, but also I am seconded to the Office of the Pacific Ocean Commissioner as well. So I come from those two um, different directions. Um, just to get a remind ourselves what we're talking about here, um, this picture taken from a satellite um, obviously shows the area we're talking about. There's quite a lot of ocean there and not so much land. And it's probably a good uh, impression to take home that the ocean is very important, both for us in our present day lives, but also going back in time through history, ancestry, and migration. So this is an image I think that's quite important to keep in mind when we talk about the economies of the region that we're talking about. So the UN Oceans Conference, um, I could say a lot about it. It was the first uh, SDG conference um, to look at development and implementation of Agenda 2030. So this is the agenda that has been signed up by a majority of the governments around the world. Uh, it includes 17 SDGs, and one of those SDGs, SDG 14, is related to the oceans. And this was a conference focused on SDG 14. It was co-hosted by Fiji and Sweden. Um, and I think that the Pacific, from what is said, had had quite a strong influence on um, the inclusion of certain targets within SDG 14, particularly the target related to the blue economy. So in a way, the leadership shown by Fiji rather reflects some of the processes that went in into the structuring of Agenda 2030. The conference was projected as a game changer in the text about it. Um, it was trying to change, trying to create a reboot or a reformulation, a new trajectory of the way that we deal with oceans. Because the backdrop is, is that um, many aspects of the oceans are being degraded, various aspects are being lost, things are not getting better in the oceans. And that suggests that the way we're trying to manage and implement activities in the oceans is not sustainable. 
So it's trying to recapture a trajectory towards sustainability. There are about 6,000 delegates went to the UN Oceans Conference, so it was quite busy. There was more than 150 side events, plus various exhibitions going on, as you can see in the pictures. Also some music trying to give uh, a taste of the Pacific to the rather concretized environment of the UN in New York. The three main outcomes that it came out with were a global call for action, which is a somewhat a reiteration of SDG 14, but also there are certain nuances within that in the text. There was seven partnership dialogues, which were more in-depth focusing on particular SDGs, or groups of SDGs. Um, and finally, there are voluntary commitments. So governments um, and other entities could put forward voluntary commitments about what they would do within Agenda 2030 related to SDG 14. All of those uh, bits of information are on the website if you go to UN Oceans Conference. I'll just talk a little bit about the voluntary commitments. There were 1,372 voluntary commitments made across the world. 307 are from the South Pacific. Over 50% of them relate to pollution and ecosystems, which is SDG 14.1 and 14.2. Fiji is a beneficiary in 23 of these voluntary commitments. These commitments have a wide diversity, so a couple of examples relevant for Fiji. The uh, FLAMA organization um, looked towards scaling up LMMAs, locally managed marine areas, um, to 100%. I think at the moment in Fiji, at the moment, it's about 79%. USP, um, it announced a Norway-Fiji professorial chair in oceans and climate change, trying to put more effort and resources into this nexus between oceans and climate change. And also then there was the government of Fiji put a number um, of voluntary commitments forward, including a reduction in the use of plastic shopping bags. Again, this is all on the website. In a way, this sort of reflects the, the trajectory forward about what people are looking to implement under SDG 14. Just a few pictures. Um, as you can see, it's quite uh, far away from the people in the Pacific who make their livelihoods from the sea. There's lots of, lots of people in suits and ties, lots of large meetings, um, lots of discussions and interventions. Okay, so the question is, is how does what you see in front of you transpose itself into the Pacific um, area that we, we are in now? Well, a couple of things about SDG 14. Firstly, SDG 14 is nothing new. The Pacific has very strong regional ocean policy, which has been developed over a, a number of decades. There's a, number, a list of different uh, ocean policy tools there. There's a whole load more of them. And a little review of them identified about 92 active and relevant targets for the oceans in the Pacific region. SDG 14 tracks onto all of those. So SDG 14 is nothing new. We already have all of SDG 14 targets and, and the indicators linked into existing regional policy. And probably the Pacific is one of the more advanced uh, regions in the world in this respect. In SDG 14, we can also identify significant ocean um, investments that have gone on in the Pacific region. So this is for 16 Pacific countries. And work here on the Enhancing Pacific Ocean Governance Project, supported by the Australian Department of uh, Environment and Energy, carried out with CSIRO, Office of the Pacific Ocean Commissioner and USP, we tried to collate together some of the development partner fundings that have gone in to the region over the last um, 10 years. This is not exhaustive, um, and, but I'd say it's probably indicative of what comes out. And you'll see a number of features of interest when we look at the amount of project finance that has been laid across the various SDGs. 
Firstly, most investment has been in to manage and protect ecosystems. This is SDG 14.2. This is by far the most dominant part of where development finance has been targeted. Secondly, there is very limited investment on blue economy. Blue economy sits in 14.7. As you can see, the amount of finance going in there from development partners is really quite small. And thirdly, there's actually quite a lot of investment that development partner investment that doesn't track on to the SDG 14. We can't classify it within that. So this is not a perfect graph. It's a very difficult area to pin down. But the suggestion is, is that the focus of efforts in the region on oceans through development partner finance has been targeted at managing and protecting and certainly not focused on looking at investments in the blue economy. So, we've had the Oceans Conference. SDG 14 is a, a, a catalyst for change, and that is the way it was projected in the regional preparatory meeting for SDG 14 earlier on in the year. And if we take a few sort of constructs forward, we see maybe a lack of consensus and useful articulation of the blue economy. It means different things to many different parties. So like, like Tess mentioned earlier on, actually coming to a usable, useful definition is quite challenging. Secondly, we must recognize that SDG 14 is, as I put here, a pathway to global amorphism. SDG 14 is a global set of targets and indicators and it, in a way, it belies some of the integrity, some of the past, some of the history, some of the identity of the Pacific. And as the Pacific Ocean Commissioner has said, there's a need to use SDG 14 targets for the region and not use the region for the targets. And this Pacific has various specificities as well, as I've mentioned before, related to its geography and ancestral past. And so there's a very strong move towards, and what has been announced at the Ocean Conference, the Blue Pacific. And I thank you, my friends in the audience from the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat for putting a lot of this together. And the Blue Pacific is trying to capture SDG 14, but in the Pacific context. It recognizes large ocean stewardship states. It recognizes a common sense of identity across the region. It appreciates integrated ocean governance. Rather than a fragmented project-based model, it tries to link um, different interventions together in a more cohesive and comprehensive approach. It tries to catalyze leverage of regionalism. So we've seen that Fiji was co-hosting the Oceans Conference. It's also Fiji is in the COP23. The Pacific, by working together, can have increased leverage in the various discussions that are going on around the world. It also helps to contextualize global commitments, not just SDG 14, but many of the SDGs that are relevant to the oceans. And there's a need for these global commitments to be linked in to what is important, what spiritual, cultural, geographical, and identity assets that we have in this region. And finally, it's also there to promote and vector investments into the region. By standing up for what is needed for the Pacific, by the Pacific, then it can target those investments in an appropriate way. And this is the idea of the Blue Pacific, which is being announced by leaders and the incoming chair of the Pacific Islands Forum and will be taken forward in the leaders' meeting in due course this year. And this probably for the region is one of the biggest outcomes of the UN Oceans Conference is the launching of the Blue Pacific. So finally, SDG 14 in the Oceans Conference, it's a game changer. That's how it's framed and we framed it in the region as a catalyst for change. But what change is it going to create? What change are we trying to use it to lever and uh, modify? 
How do we change SDG 14 to really capture the fund fundamental essence of the Pacific Oceanscape, which is well expounded in the policies um, that have been around in the region for a number of years and are gradually being implemented? How do we capture that essence within SDG 14? Are there gaps within SDG 14 that we need to include? And what is the desired investment portfolio across SDG 14 in the region? I've shown you that the focus has been management and protection. Do we need to move to a more blue economy? What is the ideal um, graph that I've shown you there at the bottom? What does that look like? Where do we want the investments to go into relation to SDGs and the SDG targets? That's a question and debate that has not been had. What I've picked up is the fragments of activity that have been going over the last 10 years, rather than thinking about a cohesive, well-evidenced way forward to meeting Agenda 2030 over the next decade and a bit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeremy. It's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, Emeline Siale Ilolohia, who is the Executive Director of the Civil Society Forum of Tonga, uh, to give her presentation on the uh, building local ownership and action on green growth and lessons from the Hapai development model and green growth dialogue in Tonga. Thank you, Emeline. Thank you. Um, Lele. greetings from Tonga. Um, it's always good to run away from Tonga only for a day, but uh, um, I'm speaking on behalf of a, a group of people, um, Tonga National Leadership Development Forum. So I just want to start by acknowledging that I'm uh, just a tiny bit of that puzzle, but I'm speaking on behalf of, of that group, sharing our stories on the blue-green economy and the green growth in Tonga. Um, This is just a, a bit of um, background information on the Tonga National Leadership Development Forum. Uh, this coalition work was um, started, introduced by the Pacific Leadership um, Program, which is a, a Australian government um, funded project. The idea of coalition work was being part of the PLP work um, in terms of thinking developmental leadership, one of the key areas that has been supported by the Pacific Leadership Program is looking at how um, we can um, look into collective actions, bringing different people who may have a common purpose uh, to work together on a particular issue. So the coalition work started um, with that thinking in mind. Um, when it started this work in Tonga, we, we have been um, humbly asked PLP to allow Tongans to see how we can shape our own coalition work um, on this particular issue on leadership. And so we have this group representations from the royal family, nobility, parliament, cabinet, public sector, private sector, civil society, women, youth, um, academia, and the communities. So we have representatives of people from these different sectors. And these sectors are kind of represent um, the different levels of our Tongan society. It was identified that leadership is what we wanted to work on, um, but we had um, no idea how, would, how to go about um, in this journey. Um, PLP has supported the research um, done to conduct, to look into um, what kind of leadership that we want. Um, at this particular time, this was in 2009, Tonga was, has its first um, democratic elections in 2010. So this is during that particular um, environment where people were talking democracy. We're talking about this huge change in how people will be more engaged, how we get people to participate, 
um, from a, a very hierarchy system where a lot of time is just the, the royalty and the nobility and key people in our society deciding for a lot of things in terms of how our development has been um, progressing. So this has, um, has led the work of um, DNLDF to the National Leadership Code um, that we, um, there's a, a national wide consultations and now we have um, a leadership code that consists of 14 um, principles. We had gone into recognizing that this code will not be a kind of a legal um, thing where you could be like trying to police everybody in with understanding that we have an already existing legal framework that if someone break the rule or be corrupted, um, you know, the law will take care of that. But this is more into values. How do we recognize that this value is something that is your personal commitment? So we, we kind of work with a more of a, a signatory process. So we had about 200 plus signatories to the code and that was presented in 2015 um, to the coronations of our current king as kind of recognition that this is what people expectations of leaders um, and, and it should be um, kind of a people's presence to the king to recognize that you know, in, in this environment, in this time of change in Tonga, people wanted to be part of that. Okay, then where does the green growth came into being? Well, POP with the conversation with the DNLDF was saying a lot of times, so what, you have a code, what is it now that you wanted to, um, uh, to do next? So there was a, a, a number of national consultations identifying issue that some of our community had identified from the leadership code consultation. And so Habai identified the marine depleting resources as one of the key areas that there has been um, a lot of discussions when we were out doing the consultation on the code. Again, POP had supported us to do our, our, our research uh, on that and it was done by the um, now the Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries. At the time he was um, uh, doing this um, consultancy work for us in, doing the re in getting the research and it was just confirming the things that people were talking about from their traditional understanding of their, um, of their communities. You know, they were sharing that they now going deeper into the sea to get the fish and all of that. And so the, con the research was just confirming all of that. What we find interesting here is that there were other challenging things that we as development actors recognize as climate change, sea level rising, erosion, waste, all of that were very, very little discussions from the community when you are really out there. And what we find interesting is that for the community, this is life for them. You know, you don't, you don't separate everyday living, your livelihood around any of these issues because they're just like they're coping. They are very distant from the developmental thinking that there is something out there that's called climate change. You know, for them, the reality is that there are certain months of the day or the, or the year that they would have to really struggle to get a bit of rainwater because that's the only source of water that they have in their small communities. So really the, the process is very much part of the, of the success of this work as well where we also recognize that there are programs already in place. There were the small, um, the special marine protected areas, for example, which supported by the small grant of CHEF, um, a project that is currently working with Civil Society Forum of Tonga. There was the, also this organic veg, uh, virgin coconut oil um, partnership by the Oxfam through the New Zealand government and the Tonga National Youth Congress. So we were kind of looking around at the communities. What are the things that is already happening that can kind of support um, 
developmental leadership in terms of identifying where are the people that we need to work with to, to translate the information that we know about development into community um, development work. So I'm just giving you a few um, photos. But what's important here is that we started to take the communities along in a tour. So that we try to get them to think this is not just a reality, this is not just a fact that, that they would have to, that they're so normal for them. You know, there's something out there that is being talked about that need to recognize that these are challenges um, that are facing. Sometimes it's caused by things outside of their community. This is just a map of, um, oh, sorry, the challenges that has been um, coming out from these pictures are the sea level rising, erosions, waste, um, uh, and kind of impact of climate change. The, the picture kind of gives you a, an idea of how Hapai is also a challenging geographically in terms of how it's being ro um, laid out. So the cost of getting from one small community to another on itself is being um, a barrier to some of our, um, some of the people in this community in terms of being access to certain social services, um, let alone the support being provided by developmental partners. Um, I'm just showing this because this is the kind of thing that has been um, important for the Pacific Leadership Program in support of the Donga National Leadership Development Framework um, uh, Forum because it's allowed those conversations to happen. And, and most of the time, you don't have these spaces in the community to talk about this, talking about um, conservation, talking about sustainable management and sustainable use of their resources, talking about the governance, how much they need to be engaged, how much they need to be um, part of this whole process. So with the Hapai Development um, um, Forum, we work with Hapai setting up their... Um, so I'm, I'm just putting this, this is how the process of engaging with our community um, in, in terms of making sure that along the way that we give them some kind of a purpose, the state of vulnerability that they are, how we support them in terms of moving to the state of progress. And that is where green growth comes into um, uh, the focus of this work. Because we felt that it's just providing the, uh, the, the kind of a tool to support this community in, in making sure that when we talk development, it's the people in the community that we consider first before we even look into the leadership, the structure, the policy, the resources. Um, and in terms of all of that, it's supposed to move them from their state of vulnerability to the state of progress. And it's, a, it's not people from outside to come and do that, but how we mobilize people so they are part of that process in progressing um, in whatever form that they want to be part of, of that process. With the leadership code, we bring that into being in part of um, putting values into this health green growth um, work. Uh, the 14 principles that I have um, explained uh, become the guiding principle of our, of our green growth work in Hapai. It's, um, you know, it's a, a whole lot of putting the structures in place as well, because we recognize that this is a leadership approach. If we are to make sure that this green growth initiative that we work requires very tough decision makings for some of our local key leaders, um, and, and they have to have a structure in place that can support um, the work that they're doing, and making sure that the voices that are raised from the community in this process are being heard all the way up to the national level. This is just an example of how our green growth plan uh, was being um, put together. And in a way, this helps for this community of Hapai to make sure that they are aligning some of the issues that they have raised from their community all the way to the national level. 
This is just an example of how we have developed our leadership code to become uh, like the guiding principles of some of our community plans and, and of course our, our um, uh, green growth um, strategy. So we, we have certain guiding principles that let the community plans, let the community constitution when they formulate their, their councils and all of that is actually built from our leadership code. This is just a examples and photos of this work program setting up village council as part of our governance green growth um, structures for the Hapai community. We also recognize that we need to have a green growth strategy to make sure that our livelihood actions are being connected. This is an example of how the, the youth work in Hapai um, are being um, Working in Hapai is an example of this. It's been picked from the agriculture show. This is also from the SMA. SMA is like the marine protected areas. And the interesting thing on SMA that we are working quite closely with women in terms of their alternative livelihood. So the idea is that if you conserve your marine resources, you have to have some kind of alternative to keep community with their livelihood so that they don't go back to their protected areas. Again, a few photos. This is from uh, the uh, Hapai Agriculture Show. And you see that they have translated the green growth into Hapai Maui Ui and Maui Lele, which is their own definitions of green growth. For Hapai, the definitions of green growth, I know the first speaker had asked, um, had kind of um, share from their study. They, they wanted to define clear definitions in the Pacific context. For Hapai, the, the, the way that they look into green growth is only in two areas. One is conservation of their marine resources. The other one is sustainable use of their agriculture in terms of their organic um, uh, work. That's very simple for the Hapai community. Green growth for them are just those two. Now, lately is the, um, the work on blue um, economy. And I will just finish off with a bit about the, the, the policy level. Um, with the policy level, we had worked with the Hapai and we have um, set up all the foundation, the groundwork. What the Hapai, the, the Tonga National Development Forum had done is they take all the issues, all the learning that has been done on green growth in Hapai to the national level. And there was a green growth dialogue in November last year. A lot of conversation has done has happened, and this, the stage of where it is now is that there was a Nukalofa declaration on green growth submitted to Cabinet. Cabinet had noted the report. Cabinet has also recognized that this is a work in progress towards green growth and resilience Tonga to the impact of climate change. And they set up a task force, consists of 11 different organizations, nine of it are uh, CEO uh, from government ministry, one from civil society, and one from private sector. So basically, that reflects that Tonga has not been, um, I, I don't see that there is any commitment at all from government as yet, but this is the first move that they had recognized that green growth needs to go into development agenda of Tonga. So with the building up to the ocean um, uh, conference that my colleagues have just shared, we had held another blue economy dialogue in May uh, of this year. And so the, the idea is that to revisit the declarations on green growth. The only additional thing that has come out from our green, from our ocean and our um, blue economy that has not been in our declarations for the green growth was to look into the issue of seabed mining. So that's going to be really tough. But I think in green growth, it's a political, um, green growth work is a political space. And I think we really need to consider that community needs to be part of that process as well. It's not something that is just happening at the national level. My apology for the bit of addition. I may not have this opportunity again, so thank you.
Thank you very much, Emmeline. Now, because of our early start, we're actually looking very good to have um, quite a bit of time available for questions. So um, please put your thinking caps on. And I might ask um, our coordinator, do we have some mechanism for our online audience to ask questions as well? Okay, we do. So to, to our uh, online audience as well, please put your thinking caps on for questions. And I will invite our last speaker, Aidan Craney, who is the research coordinator at the Pacific Leadership Program, um, to give his presentation. Thank you, Aidan. Nisam Bulavinaka and warm Pacific greetings. Um, before I begin, uh, as is customary in Australia, I would like to thank uh, the people of Rewa, uh, the traditional custodians of this land that we meet on. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, ANU, USP and the ADB for, for the opportunity today and all of you for attending. Um, I was pretty happy when I saw in the conference program that I'd be attending in the main lecture theatre because immediately after the opening remarks, a lot of the time if there's a bit of inertia about which session you're going to go to, people just return to the previous place they sat. So hopefully for those of you who that applies to, you've, uh, you've learned something here. Um, also, as Siale says, she's happy to be out of Tonga. I'm happy to be out of bitterly cold <laughs> Melbourne at the moment. It's always, always a pleasure to be able to come somewhere, kick your shoes off and wear something a bit more floral. Um, so today I'll be talking about some work uh, on the project, on the process and logic of the Green Growth Leaders Coalition. Uh, this is based on an action research project that I'm involved in with uh, David Hudson uh, at the University of Birmingham Developmental Leadership Program, Dawn Gibson at the IUCN office up the road, uh, and me representing Pacific Leadership Program and La Trobe University. So some background for uh, Green Growth Leaders Coalition. The idea for GGLC was conceived through ongoing conversations between multiple people who were involved in governments and the development industry uh, for a number of years. Um, these people were concerned that the approaches to development that were being undertaken by Pacific governments and also uh, donors and multilaterals in the region weren't actually entirely engaging with Pacific ideals and values. So, based at IUCN and with the support of the Pacific Leadership Program, in 2012 a coalition was formed uh, that involved a number of leaders from governments, regional organisations, civil society and the private sector. Uh, and and they, were, they were coalesced to discuss sustainable development challenges that they faced. Despite being based at an institution and having a formal title though, the Green Growth Leaders Coalition is actually uh, this assemblage that operates between the formal and the informal. Uh, the membership of the coalition is fluid, so different people come in and they don't really leave the coalition as such, but, but uh, it's, it's a constantly expanding network. Um, to becoming involved in the coalition, it actually requires being invited by the Secretariat based at IUCN in consultation with uh, the core members of the coalition. There are two criteria though that, that, um, that are used to, to attract and recruit to GGLC. The first is that the people have to have a developmental mindset. So they have to have the values and goals of achieving sustainable change that is in the interests of the better good. Um, secondary to this is that they're supposed to be able to influence developmental leadership and change in the next three to five years. The first meeting took place in 2012, as I mentioned before, um, and they used the Talanoa format for discussion. The, the Talanoa wasn't just uh, as a different way to approach meetings of these sorts, it was to actually truly embody being a Pacific-based organisation. Um, and what has happened since then has been that the, the multi-day Talanoa has been uh, in place on an annual basis. What is green growth? Well, thankfully, I don't need to tell you, because Tessa already did. 
Um, but just to kind of reiterate slightly, um, the understandings of green growth are that it is complex and adaptive in terms of its definitions and practice. Uh, green growth is, uh, is terminology that's kind of been imported, so, so things like blue-green economy uh, are just as applicable and are, are largely transferable for green growth. Um, it is important to understand, though, that the, the technical terminology and references to green growth that were common in the development of green growth as a framework uh, in East Asia um, are not as, as applicable to how the Green Growth Coalition, Leaders' Coalition works, which is more focused on utilising the Vanua and the Moana in ways that promote economic growth without risking the natural environment. So, in recent, probably in the last 10 or so years, we've seen a significant shift in the approaches to development in the Pacific region. Uh, the success of the parties to the Nauru Agreement, the creation of the Pacific Islands Development Forum, the role that Pacific Islanders played in the uh, High Ambition Coalition at COP21, and indeed the Blue Pacific and uh, the New Pacific Regionalism, as mentioned earlier by Jeremy and by Dame Meg Taylor in her opening remarks, um, all testify to, to the changes that are happening within the region. Uh, GGLC and its members uh, embody what what Sandra Tart and Greg Fry also uh, managed to capture in the book, The New Pacific Diplomacy. GGLC's manner of operating is also reminiscent of decades old um, ideas in the region, reflected in, in Ratamara's concept of the Pacific way for collective action, um, for, for embracing change and leadership that thinks about the Pacific region collectively and interconnected um, rather than just in the interests of, of one's own self or their, their state or institution. The multi-day Talanoa format employs the Chatham House rule, so all discussions behind closed doors are held in confidence unless an agreement is made that, um, that those discussions will reach beyond the, the four walls. The confidential nature of the format serves a couple of purposes. One is that it helps to build trust in the room. People can feel like they can safely challenge others, but they can also uh, challenge their own thinking. And quite often people will express things that, that might actually go against what their institutional hat would suggest. Even if they're not tying themselves to, to those comments, they might be asking questions of themselves. Um, and, and it also allows people to, to kind of remove those institutional hats, as it were. It also shows the willingness of GGLC to not throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and start again. There's no need to reinvent the wheel on development. Um, it, it uses some embedded development practices and orthodoxy and builds upon them in a specific manner. A further aspect of promoting regional identities occurs through the formal and informal support mechanisms of GGLC. So the more established members of the coalition are encouraged to provide mentoring support to younger and newer members. Um, and with the evolving membership and the focus on being able to influence change in the next three to five years, this is, this is really useful. It, for some, some of the younger members, uh, they've actually reported back to us that they see it as a way of fast tracking their skill set um, and their networking. Uh, this also capitalises on the knowledge that exists within the network um, but also seeks to expand on the influence uh, and leadership capacities of its members and also uses the drive and momentum that actually comes from having fresh blood in any organisation. Further support is offered through the Secretariat based out of the Pacific Centre for Environmental Governance at IUCN. Um, and IUCN seeks to maintain contact with members throughout the year between the meetings to see what challenges they're facing and what support they can offer. So today's title was the, uh, the Development Diplomacy Nexus. And the reason that we're approaching our understanding of the Green Growth Leadership Coalition uh, through the Action Research Project as representing a nexus of development and diplomacy is that typically development and diplomacy have been seen as working together, but more so that um, in a way that, that understands 
de development to work for diplomacy. GGLC doesn't flip this on its head, but it does seek to utilise diplomatic tools for development rather than development just for diplomacy purposes. So it uses tools like relationship building and meetings of high level individuals to push for development reform that limits issues of self-interest and instead advocates for awareness of the interconnectivity and reliance of Pacific states and their natural environments on one another. The Talanoa also offers a Pacific alternative to agenda-based meetings, providing space to listen, reflect and challenge. And this is, this is really key to how the, the format works. Um, instead of going in with a fixed agenda and fixed ideas, what happens is there's a very loose agenda, there is a facilitator who makes sure that people kind of stay within the realms of, of what we should be talking about at any one time. But people aren't wedded to ideas, they don't come in with, with a fixed idea that they will then push an agenda on afterwards when it comes to the discussion time. Um, it's also a meeting space where the amount of silence is really incredible. Um, people take the opportunity to not have to speak, which is a really wonderful thing, I find, as opposed to, to most um, agenda-based meetings where people are, are all trying to make sure that they represent what the, um, what the talking points that they walked in with were. Um, by engaging leaders from multiple sectors in these discussions, networks of influence can be expanded as well, and the stories and values shared by the coalition can inform policy and practice decisions individuals and their institutions make going forward. And this is, this is represented as well in the diversity of the membership. Um, so the fact that people are drawn from government, regional organisations, civil society and the private sector means there's a diverse array of talent and ideas in the room. Um, it also kind of speaks to Professor Cole's welcome remarks as well of, of the value of the Pacific Update itself that there are so many different uh, people in the room that academia is not going to solve the world's problems, uh, government isn't going to solve the world's problems, the development industry won't solve the world's problems, we need to be working collaboratively. Doing this also furthers the knowledge uh, that achieving development reforms doesn't just require the support of leaders, it actually sees the potential of leaders to be drivers of change themselves. Um, willing to promote developmental reform in the knowledge that they have support and shared values with others. So very briefly I'm going to speak about some of the achievements of, of the Green Growth Leaders Coalition. And these are actually really difficult to measure because the membership of the coalition is fluid and the members all have other institutional hats that they wear. But the way that I'm reflecting you, these to you are the way that they've been reported uh, to, to me and to Dawn Gibson. So GGLC has been influential uh, in, re in reference to national and subnational sustainable development plans. Um, most recently the Vanuatu 2030 People's Plan. Um, part of the motivation for that came through conversations that happened beginning at the 2012 Leaders Retreat. Uh, the Fiji National Development Plan was also influenced by, by members. Um, very specifically, GGLC promotes Pacific approaches to decision making. So this is seen in the Talanoa format that GGLC itself operates within. And this was then extended last year to the uh, Melanesian Spearhead Group Leaders Summit where there was a Talanoa session held. Um, and this directly came out of last year's summit uh, oh, last year's uh, annual meeting. Um, Green growth talks were also included in the PIF leaders meeting at 20, in 2012 and coastal fisheries was put on the agenda in 2016. Again, largely coming out of the meetings that happened uh, that year. And on a, on a more grassroots level or how it affects the grassroots, after Cyclone Winston last year, we had it reported by uh, members from Tonga and Fiji that uh, the relationships they'd built up through the Green Growth Leaders Coalition had actually led to an expedited response of Tongan support to Fiji where instead of going through official channels and red tape that may not delay assistance all that much where every minute counts it was really important that people, members could get on the phone to one another and direct support where it was needed really, really quickly. 
Um, so my timing's pretty good because I'm just getting my one minute wrap up. So I'll just put a quick plug in for a briefing note that PLP has recently put out on the Green Growth Leaders Coalition. Um, and there are a number of briefing notes up the back. So as you walk out and as you come back in for the next sessions, feel free to, to grab some of those. Um, but I will finish up on that point and leave it to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aidan. And uh, thank you to all our speakers. Thank you, who've done a wonderful job keeping to time and also to presenting a range of very uh, stimulating ideas. Um, there are a whole lot of questions that have been asked as well as uh, ideas put forward. So it's now my pleasure to open the floor to questions uh, and also to online questions. So uh, um, please fire away. We have one here, Dave. Thank you. So the, the question is uh, opportunity, the panel's perspective on opportunities for um, gender participation in this discussion. Aiden. Um, this is an issue that uh, the GGLC has been approaching because when you set up a coalition and say the members need to be influential in the next three to five years, that risks kind of just cementing who's already in a leadership position and giving them absolute power. Um, so a new focus has been, has been put in um, with the with the emphasis more on the five years than the three, um, to bring in more young people um, and more women. Um, and it's interesting, so doing the research for Pacific Leadership Program, uh, reporting back then to the Australian government, I know that, and coming from a development research background, I know that the question of gender will be, will be raised in a coalition where I still think about two thirds, maybe even three quarters of the membership is male. The leaders themselves are actually really keen to get new blood in and to mentor them. Um, but also the women who are involved have, have mentioned that they have seen a huge change in the last five or so years where established leaders are reaching out to them, which I've found really interesting. It wasn't something that I was aware of previously. Thank you, Aidan. Other, other responses from the panel? Um, just a response on the participations of women. Um, the good thing about the green growth work in, in Hapai that's been facilitated by the Tonga National um, Leadership Forum with the funding for PLP, um, because it's very much driven from the ground and we have that influence in terms of facilitating the process, um, all the governance structure of the Hapai plan um, in the Hapai um, green growth. We have introduced the temporary special measures that some of our islands um, community are struggle with at the national level into this, into this platform. So there, uh, there's a, a um, compulsory membership of women and youth and disability, if, if that is part of the, of the questions that you ask. So it's, it's interesting because when you have that space, you can really influence what's going on there from the community and it's, it's coming from them. So it's, it's very much, much easier than when we try to get us women into politics and into parliament, which I think that we need to make sure that if we are having some of that at the national level, it can be mirrored at the community level and, commun and green growth it's just a new thing. It's totally new in terms of engaging people. So it's a great platform to introduce what we can do at the national level. Thank you. Thank you. Were there any other comments or should we move to the next question? Uh, Tess has also helpfully reminded me 
uh, if, we, if uh, people could identify themselves when they ask a question. And thank you, David, from ADB's regional office for that, that very pertinent question. Uh, do we have any more questions? Up the back left there. while the microphone is... Oh. Oh, do we have a question here first and then we can come up there second? Yeah. Go ahead, please, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Raymond uh, Prasad uh, from the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat. But uh, I hope my questions do not represent the views of the Forum Secretariat, so I'll have uh, a few questions for each of the panelists. Uh, and starting with Jeremy, in terms of the investment that he showed on the 14.7, uh, uh, and that was only one side of the story given that it uh, reflects the donors. What about the countries? Where they are investing in terms of the spectrum of uh, SDG 14? <coughs> On the, on the green growth framework and the research, I understand that this is more like a ex post analysis of the green growth framework that are being developed in the region. But first of all, going, uh, going back a step and looking at do we really need green growth frameworks or it can be better integrated into the national development plans. Um, given that my experience in the region is that you keep on creating new frameworks, you need new resources, new policy metrics, new human resources, as well as the political uh, capital that is required behind it, and it creates multiple targets, multiple frameworks for small administrations to manage which they cannot over time. Um, one good example would be to look at, for example, the public expenditure analysis, uh, which has about 28 indicators. Can it be expanded to cover expenditures related to green and blue economy, to look at efficiency and effectiveness of public expenditure on these areas and whether they are delivering? and so that it can be easily monitored as well within the context of current frameworks that are available. And this is also uh, to uh, CLA from the CSOs. Uh, do the CSOs think that creating a new fr uh, framework gives them more power and more uh, dialogue with the government rather than working in the realms of the existing national development plans and making them effective? What I see in the region is in most cases is that if there's a plan or, or a framework that doesn't work, then everybody creates another one rather than fixing that one and making it more effective. So do we need multiple plans or one plan which is more, can be adapted over time to make it more effective? Thank you. To the panel, thank you. Jeremy. Um, thank you, Raymond, for that rather difficult question <laughs> on, um, on about countries' investments in, into the blue economy and SDG 14. Um, the problem is, is that there's no, there's no um, coherent analysis or evidence base um, on which to base that. There has been work done by people in this room um, in relation to fisheries and investments from governments um, in fisheries and different areas like that. But there's no comprehensive uh, view of what's going on in the countries of the region as a whole, um, which you can then sort of match on to what's going on in terms of development finance. And so there's, we know there are things going on, for example, the Fiji government's investing in you know, ice making plants to promote fisheries in distant areas, and that's quite a big investment for the Department of Fisheries. Um, but there are other investments which are not going to be in fisheries, in other ministries, and there's no comprehensive picture um, of how that happens. And probably the linking the domestic um, use of the budget and where the priorities are with the development finance would be a good thing to do, but that um, information doesn't exist at the moment. Thank you for the question. Um, if I don't, um, if I'm not able to answer <laughs> all your questions, but I, I think what I had picked up my understanding of your questions is around whether we need so many other plans or should we just focus on, on working with the national uh, strategic framework that each of our country has. I think that will be the ideal to just have one plan, but our experience on the ground is that it's not there. 
the, the plan that is existing, there's a lot of gaps in terms of engaging people in developing of the plan for one thing. A lot of our communities were being left out, not being engaged. There are also things like, for example, in Hapai, it's very much a marine um, island. Their livelihood, everything depends on the marine. But when you look into their education system and what's the plan state for them or for their education system, very little around building skills and development for our young children into that marine area. It's very much into becoming a accountants or whatnot, which is good for some of the kids that would make it all the way up there. But for those that may not have the opportunities to go that way, how do you get the plan to reflect that to develop our young children around the natural resources is their livelihood? So those are the kind of gaps that's missing. A lot of our plans is just very much focused in Hapai on infrastructure, roads and everything else. But how can we have an alternative plan that is good to start introducing so we talk about it, have those conversations about it, and gradually build that in into the national development plan? I, I don't think that I argue that we should not have just one clear plan. But if it's not there, then it's good to have a, a strategy in terms of green growth to start having that those conversations, engaging a community, looking at what they can do in terms of building that whole platform, and later kind of build into the national plan, if that's answer your question. Thank you, Raymond. I was going to answer your question until you started mentioning expenditure analysis, and now Matthew's going to answer your question. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll start. Matt might like to add. I think, the quest I think your question is exemplified by um, the twin things that we've looked at in terms of Vanuatu and Fiji. So Fiji has the Green Growth Framework. Vanuatu incorporates green growth into its National Sustainable Development Plan. When we talk to people in Fiji about what was happening with the Green Growth Framework and what next, we certainly were left with a sense that there was a lack of clarity as to how it was going to relate to the National Development Plan, which when we did our field work was not yet in place. And that included, w did, was there a hierarchy? Was one a means of reporting against the other or taking the other forward? The point that you make about stress on small bureaucracies and government systems is a valid one. Um, on the other side of the coin, in the Vanuatu context, green growth is a very small part of the National Sustainable Development Plan. So we could have had countless conversations about the National Sustainable Development Plan and nobody would have mentioned green growth. The only reason they talked about it was because we specifically asked about it. So it's all encompassing. So that sort of gives you two versions of, of how that might work. And I think in both of those countries, you, you, we're not yet in a position to do an ex post analysis because neither of them have been in place long enough to be, they're only just, in both countries, they're only just being referred to as reference points for new policies or programs being taken forward by government or civil society. So we've yet to see um, what those issues are. Certainly in Fiji, there does already appear to be a bit of stress around things like who does the measuring, are the targets right, you know, what are the indicators. In Vanuatu, they're still finalising their indicators. The Fiji Green Growth Framework doesn't appear to have a baseline. In Vanuatu, they're very keen to have a baseline. So I think given a little bit longer, we will hopefully be able to come back and answer that question maybe with a bit more um, certainty. Matthew, do you want to add anything? Matthew has a very healthy scepticism about policy. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Raymond, for your question. I, th I think it really um, hit the nail on the head. Um, I guess uh, I think one of the risks when we talk about green growth is that we do tend to pigeonhole it and um, treat it as purely an environmental issue. Um, 
I think the fact that that is what has been happening is reflected to some extent in the, um, the donor allocations, which, um, which Jeremy showed. Um, that focus very much on, on conservation rather than on looking at growth opportunities. Um, and uh, I think for it to really have a transformative effect, it really does need to be integrated into and, and accepted by ministries of finance, integrated into budgeting and so forth. And, and that's where, where I think the, the region is not doing so well. Thank you, panel. Our next question is uh, up top left there. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, sorry. I'm Claire Slatter and I'm with the School of um, Government Development and International Affairs. Um, I have two questions. Firstly, thank you to the panel for excellent presentations, really interesting. Um, two questions, one for Tess and one for Jeremy. Um, I like the research that the team is doing, Tess, in terms of like looking, if you like, at, well, unpacking and examining what this is all about, but also to some extent looking at the difference between rhetoric and reality in terms of how this is feeding into policy making. I'm, I'm assuming that's kind of really what part of what you're doing. Um, and, and you've talked about the trade-off between um, economic growth and environment and social um, concerns, if you like, which you know have to do with either protecting the environment and protecting people's livelihoods, health and, and, and so forth. I'm wondering to what extent the um, what's on paper or what you've been able to gather from your research says anything about um, green growth in relation to extractive industries and in relation to trade, because you talked about you know this being seen as an assertion of self-determination. Um, you know, is there concern about how trade agreements, for instance, may constrain the right to regulate in the national interest and particularly in relation to environment and, um, well, protection of, of livelihoods, protection of health and so forth? You know, is this, or is this quite separate from, yeah? And also, there seems to be a contradictory kind of um, path in terms of going into extractives in, in the region, you know? And how does this square with or how does this relate to the green growth consciousness and frameworks. So that's the question for Tess. And for Jeremy, thank you for the um, report on the Oceans Conference. A lot of us are very interested in what went on there. I thought that um, Brooke Takala may be here and might have asked this question, but I can't see her in the room. I understood that in the preparatory um, meetings that were being held before the Oceans Conference, there was a discussion of and in a taking on board the concern about what we might call um, legacies of nuclear colonialism in the Pacific, and particularly the, um, the high risk of pollution uh, in the ocean, marine pollution from particularly Runnet Island and the dome that's there, and which is leaking radioactive waste. Um, this is a major concern. So we can be concerned about plastic in the ocean, but this is like life-threatening, as well as, of course, threatening the tuna. And there may well be the same sort of concerns in French Polynesia, you know, legacies of the French testing. So I didn't hear anything from that. Was it taken on board as part of 14.1? Were there any commitments made? I mean, particularly we're interested in French and the U France and the US making any commitments to you know, attend to this unfinished business of what they left behind from those years of French and American testing of um, nuclear bombs. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Claire. I'm going to give Wes 10 seconds to draw breath because he's going to answer the bulk of that question. I'm going to, it's great having people to, to fob these things off to. I think part of, uh, to just give Wes a bit of an intro, I think it ties in with um, one of the points that Dame Meg made this morning, which is that we're very good at playing away, um, but when you bring the game back home, then the rhetoric can change, and certainly how it plays out in practice can change. So with that, Wes is going to come and address the specifics of your question. Thank you, Tess. Uh, I don't, I'll, I'll give it a shot, uh, <coughs> perhaps by way of anecdote. Uh, when we talked with the Minister for Lands for Vanuatu, uh, Minister Ralph Regenvanu, and talked to him about 
how green growth squares with things like uh, extractive industries and uh, perhaps regional trade agreements. Uh, he, you know, he said things like, we're quite lucky in Vanuatu that we don't have significant fossil fuel resources under our seas and so we don't have these uh, big dirty industries. He said that you know, we don't have significant logging in Vanuatu so we don't have to ma ask that question in a sense where the rubber hits the road, you know, where you're balancing the um, benefits of, of exploitation, uh, resource exploitation with concern for managing the environment and these other things about Pacific uh, stewardship of ecologies and uh, uh, management of Vanua and Moana that we have heard is part of the Pacific uh, notion of green growth. So, uh, yeah, the, it's, a, it's a very good question because uh, if you have this commitment to Pacific ideals, how does that square with projects, you know, like here in Fiji, the plans for a, uh, potentially a very large uh, new mine in Namosi. Interestingly, with regards to the trade agreements, both Fiji and uh, Vanuatu have so far refused to sign this new trade agreement with Australia and New Zealand, the uh, PESA Plus trade agreement. Uh, in Vanuatu in particular, I think there's a real sense and has been for a long time that uh, the, the, the prerogatives that underpin uh, joining the World Trade Organization, signing new trade agreements, don't square with uh, some of the uh, national politics around, around land, around environmental stewardship, uh, around Pacific values. So I think uh, that it's not a coincidence that you, know, you have ministers who are committed to a Pacific notion of green growth and less commi committed to extractive industries and uh, free trade agreements. I don't know if that helps to answer your question, but I had a go. <laughs> And in relation to uh, the nuclear legacy um, left over from nuclear testing, and um, it's correct that um, as part of the 10-point declaration that came out of the regional preparatory meeting for SDG 14, that one of those areas identified was related to the nuclear legacy and also the unexploded ordinance in relation to World War II wrecks that uh, litter certain areas in the Pacific. Um, so that's identified in, in that leader's statement. It has, it, and it was mentioned as well at the Oceans Conference, but it's, it's more of a regional issue that needs to be uh, rendered in a, in a regional way um, to find any solutions to that. So it wasn't in the outcomes of the um, UN Oceans conference or anything like that, but it was a point of discussion within that. Um, and obviously this is something that the RMI government, the Marshall Islands government, is pushing very strongly towards coming to some solution um, for that because of the, the Runit Dome and the, the uh, possible leakage that is going on of radioactivity waste. So it's a high priority for the government and I think that there's increasingly appreciated the regional issue. It's not just a one country, one government issue. It's something that could Im potentially impact upon the region. You mentioned tuna stocks. Obviously, you know, there's a lack of diversity in economies and a heavy reliance on tuna. So the interaction between nuclear issues and tuna, you know, is a potentially issue, as you have mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Just a quick comment about um, the, the trade-off, um, and I know that there's been questions. I think that's the that's the most challenging thing that we find working from a leadership perspective on green growth is is when you really expect your leaders to make those decisions on those trade-off. Um, it's not it's not easy. It's very hard, and and our ex our ex. Um, uh, example from Tonga is now looking into the seabed mining as part of 
something that need to bring into green growth discussions. And when you have the ocean, and it's very much part of it, but when leaders are making tough decisions, expected to make tough decisions on that, you will start listening to things like precautionary measures. You will start to th hear things about, let's do some more research around some of these issues to inform us to decide on on something that we may not have the time in the world to wait for those research. So those are the kind of challenging things that we find from a leadership perspective on Green Group, it helps us have those conversations happening at the local level. Thank you. Thank you. Now with lunch fast approaching, I think we've got time for at least one more question. Do we have any questions online? Well, we will, we will try and improve the audio and uh, thank you for bearing with us, those watching online, and thank you for the, the comment as well. Uh, do we have another question here in the audience? Up in the back left there. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. Quick uh, comment, uh, Yusuf Mayawa from UNSCAP. Um, going back to what Jeremy said about SDG 14 uh, representing nothing new, uh, in fact, I do think it does represent a couple of things that are new. First is that it's the uh, and, and speaking of SDG indicators, uh, not perfect, and some people say not good enough, but they, they, they represent the first global consensus. And if we put them in our regional plans, first regional consensus of where we are heading or, or you know, the kinds of indications that we want to measure. Uh, and I think that's an important uh, contribution of, of SDG. Secondly, SDG 14 is in the context of the other SDGs, which include indicators on trade and on the possible impact of trade on, on, on things like socioeconomic inequality, poverty, and growth. Uh, it also includes uh, indicators that relate to, can relate to contamination um, and, and, and the pollution, including of the environment. So if, if, if we look at SDG 14 in a context of the other SDG indicators. I think we can begin to see a way forward for some of these issues raised with regards to trade and, and, and nuclear testing and, uh, and, and the, uh, the, the, the war relics that are in the oceans. Thank you. Would any of the uh, panel like to um, respond on that? Yeah, I think, uh, I think I can uh, agree with that. And the Agenda 2030 is quite important because of the inclusion of SDG 14, which was um, partly related to the efforts from the region to include that and 14.7 on the blue economy within that. Um, so yeah, the global consensus is, is important. The way that uh, uh, affects transpires within the region, I think, is the, is the important way. Um, that we need to see what actually difference is that going to make. We, as we saw at the Oceans Conference, there is global consensus, and that's documented through the SDGs, uh, including the SDG 14. But what that actually means to the region has yet to, to transpire. And obviously, there's the indivisibility um, between the different SDGs, SDG 14 and the other 16 SDGs that we need to consider. Um, Ironically, there was an SDG 14 conference, which sort of uh, goes against that somewhat, but throughout the conference, there was discussion on the linkages of oceans to many other um, areas. And I think just coming slightly back to blue growth or green growth, I think that there's an appreciation um, that I picked up in terms of the way that we appreciate growth um, finance, money, GDP, however we want to express it. We're not just talking about revenue, but we're talking about maybe a wider dimension of what money or economics is about. Um, thinking about social capital, what does that mean? Flows of social capital coming from marine resources. And I know that uh, within the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat and other people, there's some discussion on looking at more social accounts or um, the way that s both social and economic indicators can be included when you think about blue or green growth. 
And I also look towards UNSCAP as well about looking at ocean accounts. And they, they have, as part of their voluntary commitment at the, um, at the Oceans Conference, are moving forward with trying to develop ocean accounts, which will again give us maybe one of those top level pictures about what is going on in the oceans that we don't really have at the moment. We focus on particular projects, particular investments, particular initiatives, but we don't have the wider picture within that, that, uh, w that works. So therefore, you know, ocean accounts may be one way to view some of these, um, a wider portfolio of activities within the ocean area as being very useful. And also widening the view of just money or dollars or GDP in terms of how we inculcate green growth and blue growth into our planning is a good way forward, I think. Thank you, Jeremy, and uh, thank you, Yosefa, for that comment. I think in view of time, I might uh, draw the session to a close, unless there is anybody urgently needing to add another comment or query. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our panellists. There have been four very stimulating and interesting presentations that in a space where we've identified quite a bit of um, we've identified quite a bit of definitional and other uncertainty and uh, um, need for further investigation. Um, I think w with, uh, for example, uh, Jeremy's very interesting chart, um, um, we've, for example, shown um, some striking some striking findings that are quite telling and point to, uh, again, the need um, to do further work in this space. Um, I think um, we've also learnt, and I might borrow a small quip from my wonderful colleague Anna here, that blue-green economy is more than just a turquoise economy, um, that there's, um, that there's, there's um, tremendous um, opportunity but also responsibility here in, um, to identify um, what, what's possible for the Pacific um, in this space um, where we're looking not just at um, narrow definitions of growth but um, we're also looking at the environmental and social um, aspects of that. So if you could join me all in thanking our panel again. <laughs> and we'll break now for lunch. So thank you very much for joining us at this session. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for that, uh, Gordon. Uh, lunch is served at the tent where you had your refreshments. Uh, it's open to everybody, so please join us for lunch. Uh, please come back at 2 p.m. Uh, you can still choose your sessions. All the Blue Green Economy sessions for today will be in this main auditorium. The connectivity sessions related would be at the Videocon Room 1 and the labor sessions would be at Videocon Room 2. So please be guided accordingly. Uh, come back at around 2 o'clock and enjoy your lunch. Thank you.